Kunst versus Climate Change, Emerging in Ecosystems for Love, Kate Austin, <laughs> your Thank stage. Thank you, Henning. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, crikey, now I need to get my head in the game. Um, we have this amazing setup for you, and I'm going to talk about... Um, some stuff that I find quite interesting, um, which is my work, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at how um, art interventions that I make address uh, the issue of climate change and the way that we connect to the environment. But to tell you a bit about who I am, so that you've got an idea uh, that's more than just me waving at you from here. Um, so. I find, I find that uh, it's often difficult to try to convey oneself um, without having the chance to, you know, all of us have a nice chat and get to know each other, which is the way that I would like it to be. Um, but sometimes giving a talk is the thing, so here I am. To give you some idea of how I anchor into the world, um, I am the Cultural Fellow in Art and Sciences at the University of Leeds, um, and I also hold a couple of artist-in-residence positions, um, one with the Friends of Scott Polar Research uh, Institute in Cambridge, and one at University College London, um, where I work with the Maths and Physical Sciences faculty, and I also lecture on art and science there as well. And so, I mean, like, it's probably quite obvious that what I'm interested in is art and how it connects to the environment. So, the main motivating factor for me, um, and it's been a motivation since I can remember, is uh, to kind of interrogate how we can live well with what we call the environment, which is the other than ourselves. Um, and I stumble over these words, and I still haven't found a good way to uh, kind of substitute for them. So I'm going to pray the entire talk by, uh, or encapsulate the entire talk in the proviso that I, when I talk about ourselves and when I talk about the environment, what I mean is a continuum uh, that we are constantly exploring. So a lot of my work actually looks at where these boundaries between the self and the other is. And that's kind of, so when I stumble over saying the environment, it's because I think that in fact, the environment is partially an extension of ourselves um, and that we're a lot more permeable than we tend to think. Um, and so after a lot of kind of searching, uh, and a lot of kind of looking at all of the, you know, wonderful facts and data that we've got about, you know, our relationship to the environment. I realized that a lot of the problems that I was concerned about, you know, biodiversity loss and climate change and, um, you know, uh, acidification of rivers and all of the rest of it, like, there were a lot of facts that we knew, but we we still don't act in the way that we need to, to actually, like particularly to ameliorate climate change. Um, and so I figured like maybe my role at least is, is not to add to the facts, but to think about what else we need to know and how we need to know it in order to get that motivation for change and for kind of living better within the world. And so the projects I'm gonna talk to you about this evening, um, they are a part of that exploration, a part of that um, search for what we need to know and how we need to know it. So the first project I'm going to talk to you about is a project relating to food. And food's a really kind of, it's a, a useful, um, easy to understand 
example of where we have permeable boundaries because, of course, when we eat, we're taking the outside into ourselves and we're actually incorporating it within ourselves. It comprises us then. And then we send some of it out again afterwards, right? So we are part of this flow of matter and transformation of matter um, every time we eat. And it makes us one with the environment that we're in. Um, and so... I, th I wanted to focus on food for that reason and also because it's something that we all kind of understand and have a lot of stories about for ourselves. So this project, Vital Flows, is it's both an artwork and it's a participatory endeavor. Um, and it's, um, it's in participatory nature. It's an, a set of open source practices for... Uh, looking at food from different perspectives. So it's a series of workshops where we use different research strategies and then co-create and co-design at the end of it. Um, and the research strategies are really, really varied. So it goes from uh, image theater, which is a type of forum theater, uh, which is when the audience participates in a theatrical exercise and it's used normally to explore the power dynamics between different people in society. And in this case, for, for Vital, the image theatre workshops explore how the food and the environment also have a power dynamic with us and explores their agency, so how they act upon us and how we act towards them. Um, and it's, it's quite a useful way of kind of reconsidering the relationship to food. Um, and we also, oh yeah, here's some nice pictures. So bottom left is an image theater workshop um, where the girl lying on the floor is the ground that's being cultivated uh, and the girl n crouching next to her is a gardener and we're all around them and joining in an interpretation of who is agentic in that and who is acting upon whom. And the the person who's, black trousers you can see um, was very adamant that it was not that the gardener was the person acting upon, but the stronger force actually was the ground who was making her kneel down in order to interact with her. So, I mean, it's, there are various forms of truth in that. It's more a way to explore our perceptions of how things work than it is a way to find an absolute truth about it but it's very illuminating um, and it's a kind of knowledge that we can take within ourselves and then um, create around or that might change our behaviors and um, our relationship to the outside world so we also go foraging as part of these workshops which is foraging is a wonderful um, socio-political act um, it's one of the few things that we do in regular life where there's kind of no plan B. Like if you fuck it up, it's that's it. You're you're dead. You just ate hemlock kind of thing. So you, it's um, it's a really exposing thing. And by exposing you in that way, it shows you all of the structures that are in place around you, in order to um, to to have an influence on your life. And so. It's not only about the knowledge of the food that's available in your local London park in this case, but it's also about what exists around you in all the other food networks and what that means and asks you to, to think about, like to raise questions about whether that's how you want it to be and what to appreciate about it and what could be changed about it, you know? and. Um, I found that the foraging uh, often makes its way into whatever we co-create at the end of the workshop series because it's such a transformative uh, practice. Um, other things that we do, you can see um, at the top where everyone's wearing green lab coats. Not strictly necessary, honestly, but it looks nice and sciencey. Um, <laughs> we're doing some DIY chemistry. so. Um, we have some protocols that allow for testing of micronutrients in food, so things that are, you know, 
like they're in smaller concentrations than things like you know fats and proteins, but that are still important normally for health. Um, and we can extract them using things that you can buy from a normal like um, you know garage or hardware shop or something like that. Um, and if you know what you're doing with the chemicals, you can get an approximate kind of um, bit of chemistry, analytical chemistry going on. Use a DIY spectrometer, which um, I've been working with uh, somebody in Berlin to develop these protocols for the DIY spectrometer, which is also open source. Um, and you can make it for about 40 euros, which is super awesome. There's online platforms that you can plug all the data into, and with a little bit of knowledge, you get to see, you know, what chemicals you're getting out of these um, bits of food, like tomatoes or grapes or whatever. Um, and that's also, you know, so that's kind of the other end of the scale of an exploration from the, from the foraging workshop, which is super macro. Um, so that gives you a bit of an overview about VITAL and how we um, can kind of rediscover collectively our relationship to food. We also do, uh, the first thing that I do with the participants when we get together is we start to um, explore our different stories about food, so our cultural stories or our individual likes and dislikes and the kind of systemic effects of different production and supply lines actually starts to emerge out of these cultural exchanges. Um, so it's, that's really interesting to see, particularly because it's a very multicultural area that I work in, in London. So we get these sort of stories of foods that have traveled with people's grandparents across the globe and now are part of a, like a much harder to get the ingredients over in the UK and so people substitute and we get these wonderful rich stories that come out and it's a wonderful foundation for then exploring things further on um, as we all work together. And often those stories also feed into the aesthetic of, um, of what we make at the end. And so um, these are just some examples of the pop-up exhibits that we made a couple of years ago. Um, so we've got a, a foraging whodunit detective story where, um, where we have to see which plant killed somebody, which is like, for me, this is beautiful because it was like the plant had the agency as the murderer, you know? Um, and we've got a foraging station with a whole DIY science um, set up to explore developing new protocols. Um, we've got a global system of uh, banana supply um, as a Rube Goldberg machine. And uh, this one, this installation on the bottom right was really, really beautiful. It was about accessibility, but looking at accessibility from all the different uh, perspectives. So everything from financial to knowledge, uh, or the whole spectrum. And it was interactive, so it asked people to move uh, different plates of food around depending on what they thought was more or less accessible to them. So that's that's it. That's a, it's a series of seven workshops. Um, it's been incredibly impactful. Uh, I've run it for two years now. I run it as part of an undergraduate program uh, at UCL. And we work with a community of young people in Newham, in East London, which is a, a healthy food desert. And um, when we walked into the room the first year that we did it and we asked people what's the most important thing about food, they universally said calorie content. And calorie content is a, a particularly problematic thing because it's a, it's a unit of measurement that was developed in order to treat food like fuel. Um, and it was developed to work out how much food factory workers needed to do their jobs. So it's a, it's a highly politicized unit. And, uh, and of course, it's just made its way into our common parlance, you know. Uh, it's often also, it's like measured by uh, looking at how much food is, uh, how much energy you get by burning a certain amount of the food. And it's not 
super representative of um, how we digest and process it either, or the nutritional content, or the cultural richness that we get from eating, you know. Um, and at the end of the series of workshops and the co-creation exercise, one of the most vocal at the beginning with the calorie stuff um, said, when I asked like, how, how have things changed for you, he said, I now connect with food and experience it using my full senses, which I thought was a, you know, a particularly beautiful way of saying that it worked in some way. <laughs> so, super nice. So the other part of the project was an exploration of like the aesthetics um, of food. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting is super normal um, aestheticization, which is something that we see like has happened with women's bodies as well as it's happened with food more so. Um, and so I made a super normal aestheticization, by the way, is the kind of emphasizing of uh, what's considered to be the most kind of attractive attribute of something. So, you know, if you have a, like a food porn image, you'd you have like a redder apple than a normal red apple or a, you know, more luscious looking cake or whatever. Um, and so I took a series of food porn images uh, from the internet and I mo made them up into these tart cards. So tart cards are a thing that historically in London, are, like they're a kind of all-pervading um, set of calling cards in phone boxes that ladies who uh, want to make some money put into the phone boxes. And as you can see, there's like a particular aesthetic to them. And um, so to kind of interrogate how it is being used with food. I made a series of tart cards with valid phone numbers um, with answering services for the different um, foodstuffs uh, to, yeah, to highlight this kind of super aestheticization of, of our relationship to food, which really kind of cl collapses things down into one channel. Because, of course, if you're looking at an image of food, you're not eating it. You're not eating it with people. You're not smelling it, you're not touching it. And like our appreciation of, the, of taste actually is multi-sensory. We even use temperature to assess taste, that it's a composite. So it's quite an interesting sense. Food is quite an interesting thing when taste is so important to it to then collapse into this purely visual form. Um, and how does this relate to climate change, I hear you ask? Well. Uh, it's all about understanding what the different factors are that, uh, that are inputting into our lives and affecting how we uh, are viewing these things. So as I said before, food is a particularly important, um, particularly important thing uh, when it comes to an embodiment of us taking the outside in and out of ourselves. And if we're kind of reducing the channels that we use to connect with it, then it's really affecting um, what we think of in terms of this connection to the environment. And so another one of the outputs from this project were a series of uh, sensual eating talismans, which are completely the other end of the spectrum from the tart cards. So these sensual eating talismans are um, there as kind of icons to remind us of this cyclical nature of transformation of matter that happens when we eat. And they're, they're kind of like, you know, this size, um, large coin size, and you carry them around with you. And when you eat, if you use it as a reminder, as a physical reminder uh, of like the multisensory nature uh, and the stories that come with eating. Um, normally, I would read you a poem by D.H. Lawrence at this point, but because we had a little bit of a setback with all the technology and stuff, and I've been waffling quite a lot, I'm going to very much advise that at some point you look up The Mystic 
by D.H. Lawrence, which is about the experience of eating an apple. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, look it up and think about my talismans when you, when you read it. Moving on, I uh, don't know how much time I've got left, so I'm going to speed up on talking about this next artwork, which is called the Coral Empathy Device. And this is a completely different take from the Vital Flows stuff. And it's looking at the role of empathy in our relationship to the other. And in this case, it's looking at the other being coral, which is underneath, under anthropogenic influence. So um, the idea is that by connecting emotionally with the other, maybe we can uh, understand more about ourselves, more about our relationship to uh, the the outside world and maybe understand our motivations and maybe increase our motivations to live in a more honorable way um, with respect to the other. So this is the Coral Empathy device. It's, a, it's an interactive sculpture. You wear it on your head. Um, it's designed to be a fairly unpleasant experience. It's, uh, as you can see, you you're completely covered. It's completely dark in there, and you have fabric against you. Everything's vibrating, and the, the entire uh, globe shell of it is a membrane of a speaker. So essentially, you're putting your head inside a resonating spherical speaker. Uh, and when you're inside, you hear a mixture of sounds um, from under the waves, and you smell a mixture of smells. And the idea was to kind of intentionally cut off the visual um, and connect more with embodied knowledges, bodies that are held within, uh, knowledges that are held within the, the minded body. So thinking less about the body being separate from the mind and more about uh, it being a whole sensing, uh, whole sensing apparatus. Um, that works in concert with its, each other. And so by using these multi-sensory channels, I was exploring whether we could engender empathy for uh, another species, and a species that is you know, very distant from us. It's quite alien. It's not a companion species like a dog or a cat where we can look it in the eye and sort of see, you know, I understand you're feeling pain. It's something that is very much affected by us, by... Uh, acoustic pollution and microplastic pollution and acidification and global warming. Um, but we, we, aside from seeing it bleach and die, and its beauty, beauty and sort of fragile otherness disappearing, we don't see, um, we don't connect with it so much in an emotional way. So that's the idea behind the Coral Empathy device, and it's currently uh, being studied by a researcher in art and climate change to see how successful it is. But um, in terms of uh, unrigorous feedback from people trying it out, um, I had a reporter try it a couple of uh, weeks ago, and he said when he came out, well, if that's what it's like for coral in the ocean, then they have my greatest sympathy. So <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he's feeling more empathic towards coral now. Um, ah, yes, bleached coral. So, if we skip over embodied knowledge and we move directly on to the matter of the soul, um, and then I can give you some musical interlude before we have the questions. Um, the matter of the soul is basically an extension of the concept of the coral empathy device, but in looking at engendering empathy with something much further away from us, which is an entire ecosystem in the Arctic. And because that's quite a large undertaking, and I felt a little bit little in comparison, I'm focusing in on just one feeling, which is the feeling of dispersal. And dispersal happens in the Arctic in multiple ways, one of which is the melting of ice and its transformation into water, into seawater. And the water molecules in the ice both make up the ice, but are also affected by that structure. And the same is true for the seawater, but it's different. 
and you can draw an analogy between the water molecules moving between this structure of ice and this structure of seawater and changing as they do it with the way that we move, humans move, if we migrate from one culture to another culture, or even if we traverse with it, between it as a tourist. Um, and so the matter of the soul is a mixture of sculpture and music, just like the choral empathy device is. Um, and it, the aim is to indeed engender empathy with the Arctic. Um, this is me hacking a load of stuff and being in the Arctic and taking measurements. So I'm going to, as I say, play some music for you shortly, um, which is composed partially of recordings from the devices that you see both in front of you here and up here on the screen. And it's a pH meter and a conductivity meter. They are pieces of chemical equipment that measure the acidity of water and the uh, saltiness of water. And they're both properties that change when, um, when ice, which is fresh water, melts and goes into seawater and it becomes less saline and the pH changes. And so I went to the Arctic uh, last year and I made recordings in the field of all of these different um, different waters, and what you're going to hear now is a partial exploration of that um, with a little bit of local water thrown in. So we've got a sample from the lake that's near here, and I'm going to play the local water, the lake water too. Um, and that's, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that. It's a man-made lake, so it's a, a really different way of interacting with water because we've created like the stewarded environment here um, which is completely different from the total wildness out there. So we'll see what putting a little bit of human water in does to, uh, does to the music. So it just remains for me to thank all of these amazing people who have either funded or helped uh, create the works that I've talked to you about or supported in some other way. Um, and then I'm going to ask for the screen to be turned to black, and we'll start with the music. If it's possible to dim the lights a little bit, that would also be amazing. Thank you. And are we ready to go with the sound? Great. So. I hope you enjoy. I look down into a little valley, and the valley is beside San Francisco Bay. And I always thought I could put a boat in this little river there, and a kayak, and I could move it out into the bay, and then I could move it into the ocean, and I could go wherever the oceans would take me. The metaphor of water and mixing and flowing and being free.
Wednesday in Sweden. They gave me horse meat. I like to do things that I like to do. I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do. to do things that I like to do. I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do. to do. I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do.
water that's it's, it's frozen. It's locked up. water that's it's, it's frozen.
locked up. It's locked up. I like to do things that I like to do, and I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do. I like to do things that I like to do, and I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do. I like to do things that I like to do, and I'm sure you like to do things that you like to do. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kate, uh, Kat, sorry. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes left for question and answers. Great. Um, just let me do one announcement because the next talk is in German. Wir sind ein bisschen spät. Der nächste Talk fängt zehn Minuten später an. So we are slightly late. The talk, uh, the next talk is beginning ten minutes later. So if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand and I'm going to come over with a microphone. Who has questions? No questions. Don't all ask at once. Here we go. <laughs> um, Kat, maybe you can explain the, the setup you have yeah. there. Uh, what is actually contributing to the sound wave you created? Thank you. I'd be delighted. So um, this one is a pH meter. And, we're, and this one is a conductivity meter. And what we've got here are basically different samples of the water, um, water from the Arctic and water from the local lake, um, and some acid and some salt to allow for some variation while I'm playing. Um, and yeah, what you're hearing is basically the sound taken directly from the circuit board of the instruments. So the instruments, chemical instruments basically measure these things in the water and they, uh, they change the voltage which then is kind of, you can take it out and turn it into sound. So that's the setup. And when I play it, I play with the different water samples and the properties of the, the water. So I change how acidic it is. So you can see here, this one's gone pink because I added acid to the lake water to change the acidity. Um, and I put some indicator solution in, which allows you to see uh, the color change when it happens. So I play the water by playing with the properties of the water. Yeah. Some more questions. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so does that mean that on the top it's uh, purple and there will be a different sound than on the uh, on the bottom? Uh, I'm not sure how... I think the indicator solution probably is the thing that's not mixed and I think the acid has mixed through. Um, 
but it could be the case that we have a different uh, a different pH all the way through. Like we could, yeah, it could be. I didn't test it when we had everything working, so I'm not sure. Ah, but actually, I can do it. I can tell you without because I've got numbers as well. So let's see. So I'm reading the top, and the number is 1.7. And if I put it back in without mixing it too much, the number is stabilizing at 1.9. So it's slightly less acidic on the bottom. Yeah. Nice question. Ken, I'm over yeah. here in the back. Oh, Can hello. you see me over no, here? I Here's can't, the next question. But I'm going to, okay, hello over th in the back. I, I would really like to know what inspired you to start this kind of uh, music or what kind of event in your life uh, made you start it? Um, oh, I don't know. Like, I had a, I, I, um, I used to play the piano and sing and be in bands and stuff and, uh, and I kind of left it all behind when I started making sculptures. And then, uh, and then this project, like the matter of the soul, it just felt like it needed to be a musical performance. And so, you know, I like I've always liked playing with electronics, and uh, and I've always liked trying to sort of explore the world in unusual ways. And this concept just really led led me to, to this. It was, I was pulled into it <laughs> by, the, by the Arctic. Ked, yeah. thank you very much. And that's your applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good.